Unlike its Italian namesake, Venice, California feels eternally fresh and current. There's nothing self-consciously quaint about it. Maybe that's because Venice always seems to be undergoing a cultural rebirth. From the flourishing arts and poetry scene of the 1950s to the commercial explosion we see today. In fact, when developer Abbott Kinney founded the neighborhood as Venice of America, he wanted it to function as a beachhead for a cultural renaissance. And yet, despite this constant change, fragments of Venice's past persist. Visit Venice and look closely enough, and you'll find evidence all around you of the neighborhood's fascinating, multi-layered history. How can a neighborhood that is constantly reborn maintain so much of its past? LA is an idea as much as a city, a set of hopes and beliefs that inspired millions to move here. But behind the idea of LA are the stories of people Dreamers who realized their vision for Southern California, and others who failed. So let's look back and uncover some clues to a forgotten past in the archives. Lost LA explores the untold history behind the fantasy of California. In 2014, LACMA exhibited a mural that purports to tell all of Venice's history. Indeed, the monumental painting, originally created in 1941 by Edward Bieberman for the Venice Post Office, includes a lot. It depicts Venice's amusement park rides, its canals, its oil rigs, and of course, its founder, Abbott Kinney. I got to wondering, what does the mural leave out? And what is it about the mythology of Venice that inspires such an artwork, that makes its history feel like an epic tale? What makes Venice unique among LA neighborhoods? For answers, I knew I needed to speak with Francis Anderton, host of DNA Design and Architecture on KCRW, and one of the sharpest observers of Venice I know. What do you think it is about Venice that makes it stand out among LA neighborhoods? It starts with the creation of a myth, you know? You're going to be talking about Abbott Kinney and how he founded Venice. I mean, talk about creating a dream. I mean, to the max, coming mm. into an area that has nothing really to sell itself at that point and deciding that you're going to make the Venice of California, that in itself has created a kind of mystique around the place. So the Venice canals are certainly, at least to some people, they're a hidden treasure of Venice. Um, I think they're, they're fairly well known, but what I think a lot of at least casual visitors might not be aware of is that these canals were once much more extensive than they are today. Um, I mean, one of my favorite things to do when I go to Venice is to walk down the streets that used to be canals and just sort of imagine what it was like when there was water there and this little house was on an island then. I know, isn't it amazing? And to go around Wynwood Circle, because I think Wynwood Circle was water it as was well. It was a lagoon, it yeah. It was a lagoon, I mean, really, I know. It's incredible. How, wouldn't you love to just like go back in time and see what it was like? All the time, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Venice's original canals were filled in and paved over in 1929. Today. There's little evidence that gondoliers once rode here, serenading their passengers. But postcards from the archives reveal the vision dreamt up by a man who wanted to launch a cultural renaissance from Southern California. Walking down these paved over canals made me wonder about the visionary responsible for them, Abbott Kinney. He was born in 1850, and he grows up in DC during the Civil War. When he's only 16, they send him off to Europe to the University of Heidelberg. And he also goes to university in Paris, in Zurich. Then he goes traveling, and he goes on a walking tour of Italy. While he's there, of course, he does a lot of walking, I guess, in Venice, Italy, and that stuck with him. He ends up coming back to DC, and he joins in with a US survey team. And he ends up coming out to California and does a survey at Yosemite. So he comes to kind of like California. And then later on, he decides he's gonna come out here and do business. So he proceeds to move in in Pasadena. And he ends up buying 550 acres there and calling it Kinniola, like Abbott Kinney. And he's quite successful in that subdivision. And the guy's only in his 20s still. Then he moves, he goes, you know, it's a little hot out here. So he goes, I've gotta go down to the beach in Santa Monica and he loves it down there. Immediately gets a house, and he starts developing this hill. He laid out all the streets in Huntington Palisades in 1886. In 1888, there's a huge real estate collapse. He lost everything that was in the Palisades, but he kept the place in Santa Monica, and he gets a chance 
to buy this ocean park casino with a mile and a half of beach doesn't get along with the partners. So he says, we've got to split up the partnership. Let's take the mile and a half of that beach and we'll split it in two and we'll flip a coin to see who gets to pick which half. So they flip a coin, Abbott Kinney wins, and he chooses the swampy half, not the real valuable half, not the part of Ocean Park that's all expensive houses and really nice. He chooses this swampy area. We now know it as the marina. But he looks at that and says, you know, I'm gonna build Venice of America there. And they're all looking at him like, you know, you're crazy. He had this background that he was going, no, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create this situation where we have pavilions and it educates the public. We have grand concerts. His plan was to, would be an artist's community, writers, um, educate the public. It was, a, it was a, a really a grand idea. He sees himself as a good-hearted king. He had a chauffeur when he first arrived in Venice. And a lot of people know this story, but he was a black man, uh, Irving Tabor. And he found out how bright and wonderful this guy was. And he said, you know, I need you to manage some of my affairs. And he did. And so when Abbott Kinney dies in 1920, he leaves him a big house on the canals. And then the reality sets in for the people of Venice. They're going, oh, but we have segregated housing. So he had to move his house, this huge craftsman style house, ended up having to move it to the section of Venice that's called Oakwood. The idea was that if you look at the, his time, it was amazing how open-minded and unprejudiced and kind-hearted. This, this was a guy who really uh, had a lot of humanity in him. Abbott Kinney soon learned that his vision of an American Renaissance couldn't sustain a real estate development on the scale of Venice. So he pivoted. He dropped the opera, the public lectures, and embraced a more carnival-like atmosphere. Venice became an amusement park. But a key part of his vision was a more inclusive society, and that survived. In fact, Kinney entrusted the design of Venice of America to an African-American craftsman, and later took action to ensure that Venice would remain a diverse community. When our relatives came out, there was a little bit more of this, that, and the other thing, a little more French and black and black and Jewish. And, you know, we were all here. And then these other communities developed. The Italians brought the music. Vaudeville broke up, so the Jewish people uh, had a lot of uh, concessions on the pier. Um, and they did acting and musicals. You know, blacks came out, and they could not rent, so each one of my grandfather's cousins who came and lived in his granny house, which is at the back of the lot. Right. They developed their own business and went on and built their own house and put a granny house on their house. And in that way, the community built. Yeah, yeah. So this is your grandfather. And so this is my Arthur grandfather. Reese. Tried different things, um, construction, janitorial service that stuck. So he became a janitor in Santa Monica. When Abbott Kinney opened Venice of America, he applied for a job and soon became head janitor. Arthur Reese, coming from New Orleans, was used to decorating and he had a, a talent for it. And he went to the Frank Wiggins School to get more education on it. And he became the head decorator. Of a huge amusement park operation. Oh, a huge amusement. So yeah. he had the janitorial service and decorating service for the Abbott Kinney Company. Arthur Reeds had designed the first gondola. When the concession took off, they ordered the gondolas from Venice. Venice, Italy. From Venice, Italy. But wow. the first was designed by Arthur Reese. But he couldn't ride the gondolas himself because he was black. Not until 20, the 20s, well, right. And then when he bought it, then of course. Yes. Yeah. Well, and neither could any of the other blacks. <laughs> right, right. So he had to go through this charade of, th of making people think that Kinney operated and owned the, the canal. Kinney actually, as a human being, had, I guess, changed through the process of building his dream. Hmm. Um, he was a man of his time, mm -hmm. but um, as he built his dream, he realized that if you had talent, 
he needed to use your talent, so he mm. gave you an opportunity. And he became famous for that. My uncle, uh, Urban Tabor, my grandmother's uh, brother, uh, he would, uh, came out here and uh, because his cousin Arthur Reese told him that Abbott Kenny was here and they were doing the canals and there was a lot of work here. And so he was working on the pier and Abbott Kenny was walking and he asked him could he drive and he said yes. But the truth is he never drove, drove a car in his life. So he went down to the Ford place where he had a friend and he taught him how to drive. And he became uh, Abbott Kenny's uh, chauffeur and later friend. Anywhere that they went where uh, blacks couldn't stay, Abbott Kenny would not stay. So he ended up staying in places where it was just basically all black or different races, but not white. He realized when he came to Venice that he seen his idea of Venice of America, but he seen that there were a lot of uh, people that came from other places and were trying to really make a living. And he wanted to try to make sure that they had what the dream of everybody is owning a home and having a good job. There was a lot of uh, togetherness uh, with the families park down the street, which we considered like home. There wasn't too much there. We didn't have a baseball field, but we had the building with different games and things in there, and everybody considered it home. And like the churches, like say First Baptist Church, uh, every time they had some kind of uh, affair or, or, or uh, going on or something, it was fun. It was uh, beautiful growing up here. Everything was going pretty good until all of a sudden, now they're having problems with the canals and everything. Then they discovered that uh, there were oil wells around. Tabers and my grandmother and them were pretty concerned about uh, the after effect of the oil wells when they stopped pumping. Right next door to me my, was an empty lot. My grandfather bought it and the oil companies would give them two or $300 a year in case when they would discover oil, which uh, two or $300 was a lot, went a long ways back then, you know. The sand was kind of what I call gross because it was sticky like sort of. I think it was on a kind of, uh, they did so much drilling up and down, even where oil well um, did not go up. With the discovery of oil, Derrick sprang up across the neighborhood as petroleum companies jockeyed to drain the rich oil field beneath Venice. These photographs were taken by Charles Britton, who arrived in Venice in 1950. Britton was a keen observer of Venice, documenting a neighborhood in flux. He photographed the oil derricks, as well as the Black Enclave of Oakwood, founded by African Americans who came to Venice to work for Abakini's enterprises. Britain's photographic eye noticed seemingly everything happening in Venice at the time, and he arrived at the perfect moment to capture an emerging scene that was changing the rhythm of the neighborhood. So there's a strong uh, countercultural current in the history of Venice, and I think one of the most interesting manifestations of that is the uh, presence of the beat poets mm -hmm. uh, in Venice, you know, mid mid 20th century. I think when people think of beat poets, they think of San Francisco, San Francisco New York, <laughs> but they don't think of Venice, California. And yet there was a thriving beat, poet, beat poetry scene here. Also, just at that period, there was also an sort of an art scene starting to flourish that people also didn't know about, you know. So yes, Venice was absolutely nurturing a more kind of boho scene. But I do wonder, actually, now we're discussing it, if, um, if redlining and the kind of, you know, fast suburbanization of LA after the war might have contributed because Ocean Park, the neighborhood that I live in, which is right cheek by jowl with Venice, was redlined back in the day. And as we know, Venice got sort of subdivided. So you had the, you know, the African-American community within the white community, I guess, geographically parked in the middle of Venice, which, you know, one has to assume was um, 
was was very that mix was very attractive to some people and not so attractive to other people. So Absolutely. so yeah, if you were looking for kind of a more interesting life, you'd be attracted to Venice. Perhaps no beat poet is more associated with Venice than Lawrence Lipton. In his poem Bruno in Venice West, Lipton imagines Renaissance mathematician Giordano Bruno, who was persecuted by the Inquisition in Venice, Italy for his heretical teachings, visiting 20th century Venice, California. It's a delightful play upon Venice's multi-layered history. Lipton, like many writers and artists, flocked to Venice in the 1950s, and the neighborhood quickly gained a reputation. It was edgy, imbued with a sense of danger. Hollywood took note. Orson Welles famously used Venice as a location, standing in for a Mexican border town, in his classic film noir, Touch of Evil, now immortalized in this mural on Windward Avenue. Watching the magnificent tracking shot that opens the film provides a glimpse into the world Lipton and Britain encountered when they arrived. Bruno in Venice West, or Giordano Bruno, burned by the Inquisition in the year 1600. Velvet and warm sweat under the torches, the procession entered the city. Tall bronze men on the bronze great horses and the boys carrying banners, the fat prelates wheezing under the icons and the musicians. Up Main Street, pausing to erect a great crucifix in the circle before the U.S. Post Office, turning into Windward Avenue to St. Mark's Hotel, their flags and vestments, clowns in motley, peddlers hawking live birds and Turkish sweetmeats, drunks and tarts lurching along under the colonnades like any Saturday night, the PA horns blasting rock and roll, sob ballads at the tavern doors. Under his golden umbrella, the merchant prince, over the pigeon droppings among the trash cans, Kinney's dream of gondolas and gondoliers, his picture postcard Venice, chicken wire, and Pittsburgh pipe and iron, the columns plaster peeling now, the Grand Canal fouled up with oil, the derricks taller than windmills, we too, O oh merchant prince, live on to see the dregs and ravelings. This Venice of the West was born a bastard, misshapen in the womb, out of some old world whore of commerce, by P.T. Barnum bred, when business and the arts are mated, money takes the muse to bed. In the 30s, uh, it really became a slum, and rent was very cheap here. And after the Second World War, I believe a lot of veterans came here who were sort of at loose ends. It also attracted poets and writers and artists, because you could live here very cheaply. I think I read someplace that in the 50s even, you could rent a house for $45. It was, as Lawrence Lipton put it, the slum by the sea. It was a very poor area, um, not necessarily safe to live within. The canals had oil slicks on them. They were, garbage was floating in them. Some of the bridges that were over them were crumbling. And in part because it was a low rent place, it brought artists to it. And of course, you know, artists famously, famously uh, work at low-paying jobs because they want to do their art more than anything else. It goes back to the 1940s, really, and often the material that's most associated with the beat, say Jack Kerouac's On the Road, is really a record of a few individuals that were at odds with American society, and it's recollecting their adventures of, and, and attitudes of the 1940s. What's interesting about Venice is that the scene kind of emerges independently and is not associated with the, if you will, New York and San Francisco branches of the beat movement. Uh, the beat movement that happens here in Venice 
is of a group of individuals who may be more associated with the anarchist movement. They felt, a, in fact, a very deep attachment with the Spanish Republic. For them, the fall in the 1930s of the Spanish Republic was the great overwhelming loss of the century. And in a sense, that was a kind of utopia they looked at as, as, as a moment when history in the 20th century could have changed. By 1953, 54, 55, poets are meeting each other on the beach, in bars, and gathering in living rooms to read their poems to each other. One of the people who did the most to promote Venice West as a sort of haven of beat writing or experimental art in the United States, and that would be Lawrence Lipton, whose book, The Holy Barbarians, made Venice West famous across the country. Uh, so famous, in fact, that Life magazine in September 1959 uh, ran a several page article on Venice West that featured Lipton himself reading his poetry in his living room. One of the poems that Lipton himself became known for was called Bruno in Venice West. This was Lipton's attempt, in fact, to sort of embed Venice West within the Cold War. We can see where Lipton is trying to draw parallels between right-wing persecution of artists in the United States and the church's inquisition that targets Bruno and burns him at the stake. The beat writers were, were nonconformists. There was a lot of uh, unrest in the country and dissension. And of course, there were really two segments of, of, the poet, of poetry. One was the academic uh, poets who were mostly were university professors and teachers, and they had a certain style of poetry. Uh, other poets who were really doing it their own way. They were self-taught poets. Um, they didn't pick their poetry out of thin air. They were very erudite as well. I mean, they read Whitman, they read Shelley. They were, they, they were familiar with the Western canon and with the high modernism of Pound and Williams. And they were riffing on that. They were coming from that background and they were developing it and using the language of their day, their time, and finding the words that were specific to the ideas and the emotions and the visions that they wanted to share with other people. What was different about this Renaissance is that these poets genuinely did not care about becoming known. They were profoundly suspicious of this notion of becoming a popular writer. They, in fact, are known for gathering together on the beach, writing poems, and then burning them. It was a matter of sharing the poem, and it wasn't a matter of critiquing the poem and how can you make this poem better, but rather I created the poem, we have shared it together, and now we move on to the next experience. That spirit of a drawing on the past uh, and bringing it into the present, transforming it uh, with contemporary language, adding new words to poetry, uh, that is the spirit of, of the Beats. A poem in protest against the lockout of poets, painters, and musicians from the gas house in Venice West. Upbeat, downbeat, offbeat, heartbeat, buried in a time capsule, blasted into orbit around Venus, ride it, Carl Sandburg, stockyards cowboy, Ride herd on the real estate nicks of Venice. Get out your riot gun, citizens. Call out the militia. The poets are coming. Sound all the atomic sirens. The painters are making holy vessels out of the garbage cans of Venice West. I hear America singing. Bam, roll on with bam. Genie with the light brown hair can do. For the man who thinks for himself, why trade a headache for an upset stomach? Aloha, dos vidanio, au revoir, 
Goodbye. Later, ma'am. Later. What do you think Abbot Kenny would think of Venice a day if he could walk walk through the neighborhood? He'd probably think that he was right in in um, betting on Venice, you know? <laughs> right. It's a colossal success. It's been a colossal success, <laughs> yeah. you know? And behind some of the bungalows, behind some of the glass fronts of the more modern houses, behind some of the more quirky houses, there are some intellectuals, you know? In many ways, there's a really, really fertile cultural scene, so he should take great credit for that. Venice has been in a state of perpetual renaissance since its founding in 1905. Powered by its proud tradition of bohemian intellectualism, Venice is constantly innovating. Silicon Beach has emerged as the meeting place of high-tech and media. Abbot Kinney Boulevard has reinvented itself as a destination shopping corridor. Venice is booming once again. But how do we grapple with the other changes now rippling through the community? Problems like gentrification and displacement. We can start by paying attention to the persistent traces of the past. We can remember Venice's complicated history, a story that all started with the man who turned sand dune and salt marsh into his Renaissance dream. Union Bank is proud to support Lost L.A. Additional funding for Lost L.A. made possible in part by the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, California State Library, Anne Ray Foundation, and California Humanities.